We're going to be covering the cash flow quadrant, employment, business ownership, self-employment, investment ownership, because this framework has been so helpful to me. And before you just logged in, Jarrett and I were just talking about a personal story, which we'll probably share in the coming weeks as we talk about these different areas of the cash flow quadrant. But welcome to Friday Finances, where we break down transparently, or as transparently as we can, our own financial journey to what each of us consider financial freedom separately. And today we want to absolutely talk about this one thing. Let me bring it up, Jarrett. And that's the cash flow quadrant. If you all are not familiar with it, let's just start real quick with this. This is the cover of the book. This is not our own construct. This is a construct from Robert Kiyosaki, who was both famous and now a little infamous with where he's going. He's made some changes recently into his focus from real estate to other things. We'll talk a little bit about that, but I really want to stick with, uh, if we could, Jared, a little bit about the framework of the cash flow quadrant. But for those watching, this tool is irreplaceable. Jarrett, how did you first hear about Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad's cash flow quadrant? Where did that come from for you? Great question. So many people who are listening to this have probably either heard of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, or they've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And that's been fundamental in their understanding about money, how money works, how the game of money works. And I remember that I only read bits and pieces of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Like any book, I just kind of pull out what I need and, and fill the gaps. I don't think yeah. you always, you know, the total Pareto principle, you don't have to read, you know, 80% of the, of the book is going to be in 20% of the actual text. So yeah. I kind of skimmed through Rich Dad, Poor Dad, already had an idea because I had a mentor who, who kind of filled some of those things out. But when I came across, when I came across Cashflow Quadrant, it was actually in a secondhand bookstore. Um, it was in oh. basically like a Goodwill, you know, where people go and sure. leave stuff, clothes and, and all kinds of stuff from your house and books. And I just want to put out there, if you are looking for financial knowledge, go yeah. to the bookstore because I got cash yeah. for project for like three or $4. And this was yes. years ago. And I ran through that book maybe in two days. And it was just like, yeah. oh, this is how this works. And so it's been really fundamental. And actually... I mentioned this on the last episode where we were talking about why you should talk with money. My yeah. ex, um, we were in Latin America and we were walking through the streets and people just sell stuff because they're just trying to make money. Yeah. And we were on the coast of Colombia and there was uh, some Venezuelan immigrants who this goes into money and this goes into the devaluing of their money. And they were now living in Colombia, but they were selling books on the street. And I oh, remember wow. I bought her this book or we bought this book and it was 15,000 pesos. Now at the time that was about $3. And wow. I remember I gave it to her and we were already talking about money and she was looking into different things and she read through it. And she was like, oh my gosh, yeah. this is it. Because I feel like rich dad, poor dad is the theory. Yeah. The cash flow quadrant for me is the practice, right? If you read rich dad, poor dad, and you're like, now what? You can look yes. at, and I'm sorry, it's a little loud outside. You can then look at the cash flow quadrant and it yeah. honestly is set up like a workbook. So yeah. I think it makes total sense that we bring it up on Friday Finances because yes. it has been fundamental to how I think about my different streams of income yeah. and allowing me to understand the benefits and you know the pluses and the negatives of each. And so I'll throw it back to you. How did yeah. you come across it and how is it playing a part in your life? Well, first off, for those who don't know, this is the second book and that was what you were getting at. The first book is called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it's theory, yep. It's framework on financial statements, which was huge. And that, that the big visual, uh, Robert Kiyosaki actually really took time to craft something because a lot of financial freedom seems at first glance overly complex. And when you hear financial statements, you're like, I don't get it. You hear about assets and liabilities. You're like, this is a bunch of new vocab and there's real accounting meaning. The first book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, really demystifies a ton of this. But the best thing he does is tell a story. This is, in fact, if you look at his history, I mean, I've been watching Rich Dad since he first came out. And I, someone handed me Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and it actually spoke to my journey, which I won't go into too much here just for anonymity of my personal story. But I had a very parallel experience with the financial mentors I had. And I read the story, and the storytelling is phenomenal. He was critiqued for making the story up. I don't know if you caught that or if you were around for that, but he, they, uh, people came against him heavily and he always debunked that. And he was a profiteer. He invented the Velcro surfer wallets, if people recall those, and I recall those from growing up. And then that business went out of business and he was always entrepreneur. So I wouldn't put it past him to have made up this story. But 
more power to them because the best life principles come through phenomenal storytelling. So you're right. The first book, great storytelling, great frameworks, but there was a big lack like now, how do I take action? Where do I apply my energy? Enter cash flow quadrant, the cover of the book right here. And we'll zoom into that graphic right on the cover, ESBI, in just a quick second. So this was about 2001 when I was really having, I was moving from being a zombie, a civilian, if you will, to being a citizen where I was reading everything I could get my hands on. And if we took this little camera to my study out here, I have like every cat, every rich dad branded book, cat loopholes of the rich, rich, uh, rich brother, poor sister, rich brother, rich sister, um, uh, the cash flow guide. And then my wife and I played his game, which got us in real estate. Believe it or not. He has a little digital game. You kind of play, it's kind of like a monopoly game, but it's, it's actually advanced on reading cash flow statements. And this would finally push me and my wife over the edge to get into real estate when we first did. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's the context. And when I, like you said, when I got to cash flow quadrant, it, it gave a framework on what is valuable at each point of that journey. It, it guided my decision making on where I wanted to be on that journey, but also some realism on where I could be um, and where I couldn't be. And it gives a lot of shorthand language. And I think I'd like to jump into that if you don't mind and actually bring up this is the cash flow quadrant. And we'll talk a little bit about this. And I do think that each area deserves its own thing. So let me let me back up here though. Jared, before you got into Rich Dad Poor Dad Cash Flow Quadrant, had you had any entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial chops before that? Like as you were pursuing were you pursuing financial freedom even before this? Yeah, I was already on that path, more or less. I was already awoken to that realization. And we can leave my medium article in the we'll put that, we'll link it in the show notes where I kind of talked about it, but that started for me in 2015. And we talk about that on the first episode, mm. you know, defining financial freedom. And that started for me sure. in 2015. And the cash flow quadrant came later around 2017, 2018. So I was already kind of on the road and I was hyper aware of these four elements and how they can play a part in your financial journey and how everyone should probably have exposure to some of them. Um, yeah. Obviously, as we will get into a little bit more in this episode, and then we'll build on in future episodes, we'll dive deeper on each one of the quadrants and how to kind of play the game and the pros and the cons. Um, yeah. I, I just think it's so powerful. And I think anyone who's in the world, uh, the world we live in is, is a capitalistic world. Yeah. Once you see this, you're like, oh, oh, okay, I understand. Yeah. If yeah. I'm an employee, I'm doing this. I get now on my business owner or the guy who's my boss, the responsibility he has. Okay, so if I'm self-employed, now I get the discipline I'm going to need. Yeah. Oh, and then I get how Warren Buffett fits into this. He's totally figured it out and he's moved right into just the investor, which That's I right. think at the end of the financial freedom journey is really where you want to be. You're probably going to be on the right side of the quadrant. Most yeah. people start their careers on the left side. And then they move into the right. They learn the skills to be able to move across that center north-south line, but it takes a lot of time. And so maybe we should start, do you want to start with, with the employee and then we'll go to self-employed business and then we'll finish with the investor? Sure. Yeah. And, and again, we'll, we should go through each of these in more depth in terms of our personal journeys. Yes. But I, I, would, I would say that uh, I personally was an employee. I don't mind hard work. I did see limits to time for dollars. Now, the the thing about the employee graphic here in the employee, and some of you, you might be able to read this, you might not. When we go into this in depth, we'll have larger graphics so you can see this and then additional details for each of those. But what it says is the amount of active work determines your income and, and the little clock and the money sign there basically says your time is how you obtain money as an employee. Now we know this, but we, I don't know if we know that by calling that out, that means there's a different way. But a lot of employees just know I'm so frustrated with what I'm earning. And now in the state of Florida and other places, minimum wage has been raised dramatically. Like, and I don't know how familiar you are with this in Florida, but like our, our minimum wage was like 10 bucks until like a year or two ago. And all businesses are, are have that as a baseline. And when they came out and voted for a $15 minimum wage, the blowback to that is suddenly your employees believe that that is immediate. That's like a four and a half year rollout. 
So I actually turned over a team um, over the last two years, the last year, actually, we have a new team now. But before that, who suddenly, and I mean suddenly, were like, I'm worth more per hour. Well, here's the thing. We all know in every era, no matter what your hourly rate is, you're worth more than your time. And what by that I mean, like, well, Grant, you're paying me $10 an hour or $12 an hour at the time, give or take. I should be making 20 an hour. And it's like, why do you think that? Because the minimum wage was raised. Well, that doesn't mean you've added value. But let's contrast that to, and maybe we'll talk about self-employment in a second, but when I started my coaching, I was doing small business and performance coaching, I was pulling 120 an hour. And it still wasn't worth it. It still wasn't worth it. So I had this massive realization, I don't want to get paid for my time. But there's a new level of responsibility with that. So, I mean, so you've been self-employed. Am I correct in saying that? So we've all been employees somewhere. You're an employee right now, even though it's in a, something a bit more interesting than you were previously, you're still trading time for dollars. Are they clocking you or did you arrange it so that it's for output actually? I mean, it's a salary position, but it is okay. kind of clocked, but I'm totally an employee, you know, right now. And I guess let's just slot, slide into the self-employed. Sure. Right now. I'm an employee right now. I'm also self-employed. I'm doing consulting on the side. I'm That's right. helping build websites and other kind of like digital products right now for, for yeah. a company. And I just do that honestly at nights and weekends. So it doesn't interfere with my employee work. Yeah. And then, you know, working towards being a business owner, but definitely an, definitely an investor. Uh, so I have three mm. of them and I feel like you have three of them too, you, but you don't have the employee. Is that right? Yeah, I'm looking this over. I, so my, the majority of my wealth, uh, and you know, what the, you know, what that, you know, what this makes me think of for the purposes of Friday finances, we should actually add an element. And, and if you're watching this later, we'd love to hear your feedback on this, where we show two pie charts. One pie chart shows the asset classes. It doesn't have to show hard numbers. It shows percentages. Um, like I would show real estate and as a percentage, and I'd show my crypto as a percentage. And people could kind of get a sense of like how we're looking for financial freedom. And the cash flow quadrant, hear the language, financial freedom in Robert Kiyosaki's paradigm is cash flow. Now, this does fall juxtaposed a little bit to Jared's definition of financial freedom because he has uh, an extended time horizon. I have a more immediate time horizon and, and there's that, that's like a wealth conversation, but we should do another pie chart. And that pie chart also shows where our income is coming from based on the cash flow quadrant. Because you have a growth mindset, I have a cash flow mindset. And, and there's a little bit of a difference and that's important for you to know. And neither one is right, except what's right for you and your risk tolerance and your projections. But I say that, I digress. Yes, you asked me, do I have three areas? I do have three of these areas. And um, it's just not as an employee. But when you're self-employed, you might as well be an employee. It's kind of, the major difference is taxes. And if you read the cash flow Quadrant book, he actually talks about what these four areas represent are a difference in how you make money and how you keep money. One is earned and unearned income, and the other is, is the tax game. And the tax game is different for each one of these blocks. So effectively, I'm employed, but I'm not trading hourly wages, but I am trading time, you know? And, and, and in a lot of ways, it's more time. I'm trading more time because I'm wearing more hats. And then that teeters, like if I'm going through a really good season with my team, I, it, it functions more like the B quadrant, the business owner quadrant, where I pop in for a meeting here or there. I'm not even compensated for that time. I'm not, not compensated for that time. I just take my owner's distribution and a, what they call a, a market wage, which you're required by taxes to pull at least a market wage out of your business. Like I can't go take 100K out of it as a distribution and 10K as a wage. So um, I would say that, yes, I have three areas and it's mostly in self-employed. And then my game is to get as much in the investor quadrant and the B quadrant to be in the I quadrant as possible. Um, so yeah, so you mentioned three, which you, so you currently don't have the business owner 
quadrant. You have the employee, the self-employed, and the investor quadrant. So let's let that bridge. What would then be the difference based on this graphic and Robert Kiyosaki's framework? Let's bridge that. What's the major difference between self-employed and business owner in this construct? The major difference between self-employed and business owner? Um, self-employed means that you're still looking at this graphic, and I think it's a great graphic, it means that your time that you put in is still tied to the money you make. If you're yeah. self-employed and you don't get up, and you don't start to you know, figure out your plan to make money, then you're not going to make money. Uh, whereas yeah. the business owner is really leveraging other people's time to make money. And I think the big jump from the employee to the self-employed is exactly what you said. It has to do with taxes, and it just has to do with a lot more discipline. The second you become self-employed, and there's a bunch of memes out there, and I'll probably bring this up when we talk about self-employment on the whole, when we go and dive deeper into that. There's that meme that's like, I want it to be self-employed. You know, I was working 40 hours a week, and I hated my job. Now I work 80 hours a week and I make less money, right? Because that's self-employment. Because you may have to work more, at least at the beginning. But the idea is that you can leverage your time better where you're not in a, I make $15 an hour. You could start to make $150 an hour. And this gets into another thing where yeah. we will do a whole episode where we talk about value, cost, and price. Yeah. That conversation is super important as you move throughout the quadrant. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So. So on that, um, uh, so on that, I just, I had an intern and we had a great conversation and it's more of a mentoring relationship than an internship. She presented a proposal, which I'd love to talk to you more about on mm -hmm. how to take our web design company into, how do you turn a web two web design company into a web three web design company? And so we're having this conversation and she put a proposal in front of me. She said, she was honest. She said, I don't even know what to charge for this. And you just mentioned value, cost, and price. I said, well, there's two types of ways to give me a quote. And I told her about value-based pricing and she almost lost her mind. It was huge. So I, I think it's huge. So, you know, as you are looking at this graphic and as you were seeing a, a cash flow quadrant, I want to challenge any person with a side hustle or a business. If you are working in the business and you are punching a clock as an employee and then you might switch hats and you might do payroll and you might switch hats and you might do marketing and you might switch hats. But if you are, if you do not show up and that thing does not pay you because you didn't show up, you do not have a business. I cannot be more clear on this. You have a self-employed situation and, the, and this is why this distinction matters. And this is why we're going to dive deeper into these in the coming episodes. We're going to dive deeper because you as the viewer need to know language matters because language determines strategies. And obviously we think we all want to be in the investor quadrant until you realize that real estate investors have more debt than you can ever get your head around. The millionaire real estate investors I know, they have, they, they're making good money, they're living high on the hog, but they have a huge and extraordinary responsibility. So moving up this ladder from E to S to B to I, we'll break this down in coming episodes, but know that that also increases the level of intelligence you have to have the level of interpersonal savvy you have to have, the level of responsibility. So if you go out there to the gym or with your friends and on your TikTok or on any of your feeds and say, oh, I got a business, but that doesn't pay you if you don't show up, it's not a business, it's self-employment. I include your drop shipping side hustles. I include your Etsy, let AI build the book and then ship that and drop ship it. It takes work to set up. And if something breaks and you have to show up and fix it, on a drop shipping business, well, this, this Zapier stopped working here. You're showing up as the maintenance man. It's a self-employed business. It might be leveraged. It might be having great profit margin, but the language matters so that you're out there actually diagnosing the right thing. Any parting thoughts for people as we look at this, uh, Jarrett, as you look at this, any parting thoughts or additional things you want to add? Yeah, I want to build off what you said. I challenge everyone to look at this because most people who are going to watch this video and just most people in general, and I have no problem with making a generality here because I kind of no. know it to be true. I would say 97% of people on the planet are just in that top left quadrant. And so they're stuck in the, how do I go from making 100K to 120K? Or I yeah. make 50K, how do I make 55K? Because that's 10% increase. And honestly, good on you. Yeah. I want to challenge you to start to think about the other ways of building wealth. And I think yeah. one of the main parts of Friday Finances is sharing our experiences, building out different income streams because that's yeah. all this is 
It's just a roadmap to build different income streams. So that oh, way, yeah. if you're on the right side of the quadrant, you don't have to do anything and you can still be making money. As long oh, yeah. as you stay on the left side of the quadrant, you're always going to be having to get up and do things, whatever that is, to make money. And anyone watching this is probably like, well, I would much rather not have to do things on some days. Maybe I just want to go on a 10 mile hike. Maybe I just want to go to the beach. Maybe I don't want to do anything and I want to watch Netflix. Well, then you want to get to the right side. Uh, and if you're in the top left quadrant, there's no issue with that at all. I just think now is the time now that you've heard this, uh, you know, you can't unlearn things. You can choose to deny that you've heard them. Yeah. Now is the time to kind of challenge yourself and follow along. We're going to go through the, you know, the employee, the self-employed, the business and the investor, depending upon when you're watching this, those links could be below. And if they're not, make sure you're going to, you go through this playlist and you find those episodes. So, and just it. like, and just like uh, wealth building strategies, like Jared's a growth guy. I'm a cash flow guy, at least mostly generally. I mean, we wouldn't be opposed to some of those things. Similarly, when you look at the cash flow quadrant, I, I, I think Jarrett, where people will also be challenged is they have a lot of ego tied up that, oh, I don't want to be an employee. Hey, listen, once you've been a business owner, I'm telling you right now, there's a mega shift happening and in, in I coach a lot of small business clients. I cannot tell you the mega shift of how many have been in business for five to seven years, have been barely scratching 100K a year. And I mean, like I have probably 200 clients that I touch over a year and coach. And I would say of all of those who have either closed their website or stopped doing coaching with me, they've never scratched past 100 to 120 a year in their self-employed business. Everyone thinks that they want that self-employment, but they don't count the cost of the responsibility, but there's a lot of ego tied up and they took years to realize I would rather go make 60 to 80 as an employee with no responsibility, still in the 1% of the world, and have to just schedule my vacations instead of going at the drop of a hat. When you are self-employed, you do not get to go on vacation at the drop of a hat. When you're a business owner, you do not get to go on vacation at the drop of a hat. We're talking the gap of each of these, ego-wise, wealth-wise, is huge. And I'm super excited that in the coming episodes, we'll actually be diving into that a bit more. There's some realism there. All right, any parting thoughts? Where can people find us, Jared? You can just find us here. We only live on YouTube. That's it. This That's show right. only lives on YouTube as far as I know. Grant and I will leave our socials, our own social and our own information if you would like to reach out to us. But you can also find us on FridayFinances.tv. That's where we're going to house most of our information as far as a website. But our show just lives on YouTube. We know it's the second biggest search engine on the planet behind just yep. Google.com. So please reach out. We're looking forward to hearing, hearing everyone, seeing where they are on their journey with money. And um, we will see you next episode. See you next episode, and here's to your financial freedom. <laughs>